You're with Pastor Troy right here. We're getting excited. We got a special program for you. You're going to be seeing over the next few weeks until we get ready for season two. You're going to be seeing the best of the On the Dock season one. These will be coming at you hard and steady. I want you to get them out there. Check them out. Help us get them out to your friends. We want to see you on YouTube, Spotify, and iTunes as well. But this is the best of, get this, the best of season one. Get ready for it. We're going to be coming at you with a super season two coming up this August. We'll see you soon. Enjoy this episode of On the Dock season one. Best of. You're on the dock. We love that beginning. What great music there. And man, that, that tribute, we got their own on the dock tribute to Otis Redding sitting on the dock of the bay. That's our own version right there. You got that Memphis blue style in it. We love it, love it, love it, love it. We're all about here at On the Dock Conversations to propel your faith out of the shallows and into the deep. And we have been in an amazing podcast series. We've actually been working on several series and we're kind of wrapping up this whole focus on uh, human trafficking, more specifically anti-human trafficking. And we're all about getting these conversations to talk to you about your faith and how your faith can become an asset and get you out of the shallows and into the deep. We're going to give you ways and pathways. That's what we want, ways and pathways in which you can help make a difference locally, uh, even globally here in this case. And we're going to give you good ways to do that. And one of those ways is just being a part of On the Dock. We'll keep you connected to things and, and uh, we've got some great things happening. And we're going to get into this right now. We want, we're glad you're joining us on one of our podcast platforms, YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Facebook, Roku. Go to Roku, download the SermonNet app, find On the Dock with Pastor Troy, and you have found us. And try Rumble. Rumble's a big one. It's an upcoming one. Download the Rumble app. I really like Rumble. You can also get that on your smart TV. And download SermonNet as well. SermonNet's a good app on your phone. And you can also find the archives for On the Dock at SermonNet. And you can also find it at... Um, YouTube. You can also reach out to us through our social media partners. You see them at the bottom of the page, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, and Telegram. We'd love to hear from you on that way. Once you find our platforms and our social media, please subscribe, like, hit notify, and tell other people that you found on the dock. And by the way, we always want you, we always want you to become one of our Patreon partners and you can become an on the dock partner or sponsor by going to Patreon. Download that app, find on the dock with Pastor Troy, and you can see the opportunities to be one of our partners. And hey, you might get one of these fine looking coffee cups. That's, that's all we got to give right now. Someday we'll have something else, but we keep hawking that. And uh, if you want to be a partner sponsor, check that out. If you don't know how to find that Patreon app, we'll get you there. Go to our website on the doc.org and you will find links to our platforms, links to uh, Patreon site and other ways. You can always email us also at info at on the doc.org. We'd love to hear from you. And we're here back in the studio. Uh, we're ready to go. We've got a great team around the table. We've got mother Beth. Hi, mother Beth. You're holding up. Hi, honey. Hair still straight. Hair's still straight. Hair's still straight. Haley across <laughs> the aisle here. Haley Ottolini there. She's here. Haley, you doing okay? Yeah. Haley's also Hello. with the mosaicinitiative.org. You can check that out. And um, dot com too. Just yeah. look up the mosaicinitiative.org. Check out her ministry there. She's part of our Community Faith Church family. And she's a big part of our On the Dock team as well. So we're glad to have you here. And we're taking a look at our round table discussion. That's our signature thing. When we do these series, we like to wrap them all up by going back and getting deeper, going back and hitting some of the questions that were, were, were picked on during the thing and going, let's go deeper on that. So we've got some great questions. We're going to get into the depth of it right now. And you never know what's going to happen on this. But we're going to be looking at, again, the U.S. church and anti-human trafficking efforts in the work in Thailand. This church, Community Faith Church, that we host out of, uh, we have extensive work in Thailand. Started in 2014, uh, just with a trip to go help somebody get married, and we, our hearts were changed. And as a result of that, we developed relationships with the Tamar Center in uh, Pattaya, Thailand, also with Hand to Hand Foundation in Pattaya, Thailand. And uh, we, we just kind of found out, say, hey, how could we help? You know, how could we be a part? And they gave us a list of things we could do. And we just began to partner with them on an ongoing basis and develop, we've developed a set of churches right alongside them because their biggest need was just the workers were exhausted. They just wanted, honestly, what they said is we need pastoral care. I thought, well, gosh, we can do that. 
I don't know how we're going to do it 12 hours away. I'll, I'll have to train pastors. So uh, they, they said, hey, well, these four pastors wanted to do that. They believed in it so much. And I said, well, I'll train. I can train them theologically. Theologically can transcend culture and time and space. Theology of God, the conversation of God is a conversation of God. So we, we went to work and over a couple of years, we trained uh, our lead pastor, six, our, our six lead pastors. And they in turn began to help develop uh, the local churches, completely indigenous run. And as a result of that, they selected 20 more, one more leader, 20, 20, ended up being 26. I told them, you get 21, each of you get so many. And they said, oh, pastor, but we need 26. There's so many good people. So, so we went back then for two and a half more years and Beth and I went on multiple trips. Um, pre-trip, uh, screening trip. Then we went to two, two full years of classes. And then we had a graduation class and we literally saw 26 people become, uh, trained local pastors. They're now leading small groups, cell groups in the various churches and, and out into new places. And we are excited. We even got, uh, some of them have gone back into the Northern East Sun area, Karat, and these are completely indigenous led. I haven't been able to go there in a year and a half because of COVID. They're doing just fine without us because, they're you know, growing without us, they're growing without they're us. Growing when you, the Bible says, put the gospel in the hands of faithful people. And we put the, the Thai people are some of the most loving, caring people for their own. It's their culture. It's their people. And so when you, when you, when you just give them the tools and the equipment and, and the perspective, they were already ready to do it. They just, they just need somebody to walk with them. And, and we just cast vision together and they are just doing amazing work in the church. I'm just there. The community faith church, Thailand is our church here. So our church here is there and their church there is our, we're just one church family. That's how it should be anyway. So that's how we got there. And we ran across this wonderful, wonderful young lady, Ruth Jane Subakit. She's from Harvard uh, college in Boston, Massachusetts. Hey, Ruth, how you doing? I'm doing good. Ruth got our name from somebody else that got her name from somebody else. And she got it all started with Google <laughs> and she, She's a senior doing a study on us. Tell us about that study one more time. Yeah, so I'm writing my senior thesis about groups that do anti-human trafficking work in Thailand and their partnerships with churches in the U.S. Thus, she got connected to Community Faith Church and our yes. Hands Hope Foundation and her work here. She's been here in a conversation with Haley and talked a little bit about the Mosaic Initiative and some of the work they do. And she's already been deeply talking with our partners, Daniel and Steffi Voppel and the Tamar Project. And we did a sit we actually had her here while she's doing her studies and stuff. She, we've had her as part of this uh, conversation that we've had on our podcast. So it's been really rich to have you here. Thank you so much for your time. She's given up her, her her voice for hours of podcasting. <laughs> Thank and, you for hosting me. And we're going to all be very rich as a result. After this is all done, we are going to go sit somebody someplace and drink some cold libations and try to get our throats to recover. And so I want you guys to really enjoy the fact that we're fixing to give you the very best for last right now. This is the dessert. Okay. And, and, That's a lot and of pressure. You're from Singapore, correct? I am from Singapore. Do, in Singapore, do they eat a lot of dessert? Yeah. Oh yeah, We've got yeah. our own our own desserts. And dessert is like my wife thinks cake should go first. All dessert should be mm -hmm. happening up front. I think Oreo <laughs> cookies or food are a full food group of their own. But this yeah, is they're separate stomachs. Absolutely, I, and I know that that, well, that might work for me. be proven medically, but I believe there is a separate stomach for dessert. Yeah, I, mentally, definitely, definitely yeah. mentally. And, and and but I think this is going to be the dessert episode. This is going to be that what I call the pista resistance. Okay, it's going to be great here. We're going to put the icing Laying on top on of it. Yeah, it's going to be good. Yeah, we're going to be good. <laughs> We've got, because I've got questions. I've got, I've been, I, when we get questions on, on the doc, we just write them on the side. We don't get off our agenda. We save this edition, that this, this, uh, round the table is for when we go deeper and we go kind of to things we didn't even know we would learn. So I'm this ready. Go, yeah, you're ready. I'm ready too. Here we go. Here's your first question for $10,000. You know? okay. Oh, that's not the, we're not a game show. I'm sorry. I was thinking we were. The first question is, this is a bonus question we didn't get to. Uh, you've been working with trying to see the connection between U.S. churches, the intersection point. You're, you're in this uh, anthropology and, and sociology, not sociology, anthropology and social studies, studying these connections. And you chose this point. You could have chose a lot of points. Mm -hmm. And COVID helped help you make some of those choices. <laughs> yes. Right? So you chose the U.S. intersection of U.S.-based churches with work with anti-sex trafficking agencies in Thailand. Um what kind of involvement are you seeing from those Christian churches, uh, those Christians and the churches? So you may be looking at Christians just going to an independent work with organizations and the church itself. What are you seeing based in the U.S.? What kind of, uh, how is it, how are you seeing the volume of that, uh, the significance of that and, and such? Yeah, well, I was actually just saying during our little coffee break earlier that a lot of the organizations that you see uh, doing anti-trafficking work in Thailand are started by foreigners. Um, and a lot of them are started by Christians, even if they're not Christian organizations. Usually the people who come and do the work um, are people of faith and that's kind of how they get in involved. So I think that's definitely a huge factor of involvement. 
Um, and then I think because a lot of peop people in these organizations are, you know, based in the U.S. or other Western countries, um, they go back, they talk, they raise support from their home churches. They go around, they talk to people in their area. A lot of churches provide like financial support for these organizations. Right. And I think that's definitely important. I don't want to discredit that. I think it's right. something that a lot of churches do. Um, and then you have a few churches like your own that kind of go deeper and form these longer term partnerships that really have um, like a heart for and ethic for in their church global ministry um, and end up forming these like longer term, deeper partnerships where they do more than just give money. And I think it's valuable. There'll be some churches that when you see an episode like this, you're going to maybe get out there and look for a value based organization that's doing things that you value, that you see them doing effective. And you may want to write a check or give a mission gift. Yeah. That's an appropriate way to address this. I don't think that's, I don't think that's the only way. And I don't think that's always the best way to truly educate your people, but write the check. You, know, you can always write the check to the <laughs> mosaic and sure. the mosaic initiative.org. We'd love to have your check hands of hope foundation dot org we'd love to have your check we will do something with it on your behalf there's no doubt about that but but i think even deeper than that we want you to get more engaged in prayer can be engaged you can be engaged in beginning to develop supporting relationships and understanding the subject um we, we you'll find out that what's going on over there is actually there's things like that happening here so you might All be able time. to the waters are a lot closer than you think and, and so I, just just make sure you're doing something that fits you our case here at ruth i just want to give you at least a little explanation of why we got involved. I, I've always had a, I, I mean, my, my calling as a church developer, church planter has been to, you know, go in places where, where there's not, where I don't like to plow on other people's ground in a sense, meaning, meaning it, there's already work being done here. We don't really need to go compete. We don't need competition. There's plenty of need. There's plenty of things in the world where Jesus needs to go and share his heart. So I, I don't want to go where but I also want to go where we're needed, where maybe there's an organization that we want to partner with. They're, they're, they're needing that. And I think we found a good partnership with Tamar and hand to hand and it's worked for us. And it was an accident that we got in there, but, but we're there. And now that we're there, this church doesn't give to any organization, any organization. We don't give to any group, whether it's fellowship of Christian athletes or whether it's uh, to other people we're supporting, unless we can actually tactilely have a relationship and know how that relationship applies to a long-term uh faith-based relationship with Christ and to know the people, the caliber of the people, the people that's being worked through. We want to be able to, we don't really want to do short-term missionary projects, but we want to have a relationship that our people could go at any time and be a part of something we're already mm -hmm. a part of and we're familiar with. This church is very familiar with our partners in, 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 in Thailand now. And while people here can't go there every week or every day, it's not like they just show up for the first time and like, I'm a tourist and I'm here for my one week experience and it better be good. You know, my mom and dad spent a lot of money. You know, you get a lot of that in this, right? Yeah. And, and and that we want people to have experiences, but do that at camp. Yeah. You know, go 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 do a back. If you want to have an experience in totally. Thailand, go have a backpacking trip around Thailand, learn the culture, <laughs> then come back and go try to find out how you can help somebody. But so you ask, I'm going to add this question in now because you 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 said this in one of the podcasts and you mentioned it again that you've seen faith being closely tied to the human traffic, to successful work, to people being healthy and able to stay in the game in the sense of being active and able to survive. Because the human trafficking world, the sex trafficking is a very dark world. It's full of a lot of abuse and trauma victims and, and not just the victims of it, but the workers in it. Just seeing that repeatedly has got to be, it's like, it's like, I know in the medical world, my dad was a trauma surgeon. I know that if, if he covered enough trauma and there was enough things going on, he sometimes had to back off for a week and go take a break and, mm -hmm. and just walk, walk around a bit and get your, have a little breathe for a moment. Yeah. So as you look at that, how, how do you see faith? You said it's, you think it's important. You said even the non Christian based, you see a lot of them are still people of faith. What's the faith that you're a Christian. What do you think the faith dynamic plays in our ability to engage such a subject as sex trafficking? Yeah. Well, I want to clarify first that, because of the direction of my research, there are probably several organizations out there that are non-Christian organizations that don't work with churches and so haven't kind of fallen under That's the not, but you're not looking research. at that. I understand that. Right. right. So what I'm saying is like, based on my small sample size of, you know, organizations that right. do work with churches. And I think what I've seen is that a lot of people feel like a calling up. Uh, that's how they've described it to me. Like they feel a calling from God to go and do this work. And I think I've also heard that that can sometimes be misguiding that, you know, you hear a calling and you go in, you know, horns blazing and, you know, you, you don't know what's actually going on. You say, God, well, God told me to come here. And then in reality, you're like, you have no idea what's going on. God didn't really tell you to go there. But, you know, it, it does happen where people, they're on a vacation in Thailand, they see something and they just feel God, 
you know, telling them that this is what they need to do. And I think I've heard a lot of people just talk about how faith motivates their work, whether it's like a vision of restoration, you know, that they see this as part of the gospel vision of restoring life to how it's meant to be, um, you know, alleviating brokenness and pain. I've seen it um, be important in terms of people talking about how they keep themselves motivated to do this work, that, you know, there's times where they feel like giving up, but they know that it's it's a work that's greater than them, that, that it's God who is calling them to do this, that God is working through them. And so they, they don't need to rely on their own strength to make it through. So I think there's a lot of different ways that faith can play an important role. I think so too. Way. I And I certainly know there's organizations over there. I've run across organizations that are, they're, they're secular based or they're not necessarily faith based. And, you know, and, and I have great respect for anybody who can do that. As for me in my house, I don't know how I could deal over there without having a personal faith to go back and kind of, kind of download some of that too, and kind of be able to put that in the hands of God and, and know that, that the Lord can get us through that. The faith-based factor would be the only thing that's helped me survive my experiences in Thailand. And mm -hmm. I, I know that's gotta be a key part for a lot of places. And, and if you're not doing it that way, you're going to have to find some other way to, to cope and deal with this because we know that in the, in this room here, that there's a tremendous cost of cost of course on the victims. The exploitation is devastating. And you guys have talked about trauma, both, both Haley talks about this. You talk about this. Can you explain, can you explain the trauma impact? I mean, I mean, I think a lot of us go, Oh, you know, these people are, they're just working in a bar. They've just chosen this. How does the trauma is there, but there's not just the trauma on them, but there becomes trauma on the workers as well. Not the workers in the sex industry, but the workers are actually over there doing the partnership work as well. Because as you hear these stories, you know, counselors are impacted by what they hear over and over and over again. So talk about layer one being, being, you know, the, the trauma there, but also, and, and maybe where this is where Haley gets in a little bit, some of the trauma that comes to the people that are doing the work, trying to help out as well. So the fireman goes yeah. in to rescue the people in the house. And the next thing you know, that not only are the people are, are damaged by the fire, but the fireman's got smoke inhalation. How do you keep everybody healthy and keep in the game? So let's start with um, the people in it. Yeah. I mean, again, really not my, my particular area of expertise, but from what I've seen, um, having like good counseling services is just like an essential part of doing the work. And many of the organizations spend a lot of time just ensuring that um, these people who are coming out of this uh, have someone to talk to, have a space where they don't feel pressured, where they feel safe, where they're with someone that they can really begin to unpack, you know, after potentially years of being yeah. treated like an object, of learning how to sell yourself, of going through like potentially rape, sexual assault, like all kind like violence as we we've talked about in other podcast episodes. So there's that. Um, and then I think on the level of the people who are doing that work, Haley can obviously speak more to this, but I was talking to someone who uh, was a counselor, who is a counselor for one of these organizations. And she was telling me that um, she's Thai. And so previously she had worked as a translator for a counselor. So the counselor did not speak Thai, but was counseling these girls who had come out of the bars. And she was, she, so she was not trained in psychology at all. She was just a translator. And so suddenly she was having right. to not only take in all this information, but process it, translate it into English and then translate the services back. And she said oh that she was given no support. She was not told mm -hmm how to handle that because they were like, oh, you're just a translator. You're not a counselor, but. But you're she, carrying all the baggage. You're getting all the transfers. She's carrying it yeah. firsthand oh, and, yeah. and there's yeah. the pressure of being able to translate it well so that the counselor can right. understand it. There's immense pressure there. So she was saying that it was an extremely unhealthy environment for her and that she. Wasn't equipped to deal with that at all. Right. right and that right. she was, you know, she left wow. that organization and is now she's gotten into counseling, has gone back and gotten her degree in, in counseling so that wow. she is better equipped to yeah. do that. And, you know, she, uh, is a huge asset to the organization that yeah. she works with now. But that was just like one example that I've heard That's of. Really good. So you say count the, the, the one thing we saw in the Tamer Center episode, we saw that they have done an excellent job of putting counseling into the process yeah, of, of working through the important. process. And and I know as they look at expanding their thing, they plan to do more and more with that, not just at the, at the, at working with the girls coming out of it, but also beginning to work with the families of those girls and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and even trying to get in front of it some so that when people are lives are breaking down, they don't turn to that lifestyle as a solution, you know, and creates a whole new set of problems. So I, I think that it's probably a double layers that we just need to be talking about it and be, and whether, whether you're, if you're a Christian involved in it, whether you choose to have it in a pastor or maybe coaches or mentors, you need to be in some sort of relationship where you're communicating and talking about and debriefing mm -hmm. about these things and having people uh, rest. And then you need to have times where you pull back. One of the best things that we do, Beth and I do is we, <laughs> 
we, we trout D- Daniel and Steffi every time we go, we go on vacation with them. Mm-hmm. And, and, and we really, I really, the first time we went, we just wanted to get them away and let them have a chance to decompress. And then we found out, man, we love these people. And so we go on vacations. Selfishly, we just want to go right now. Right now we want to go. But but we really, I think something, one of the things that we could do is, is, is send resources, provide times when you go there just to get the workers maybe out of the yeah. zone for a bit and right. let them just That's be people for a week. Times I think so that, um, to speak to that specifically, there's a, a ongoing partnership that is, we've been, you know, uh, slowly creating or <laughs> working on uh, building a relationship with this particular organization for probably, oh gosh, like maybe three years now. Um, and I love them dearly. And um, one of the things that they said was when I was asking them, you know, we were trying to establish what their needs were and what our role could be and, and how we could, are there resources that we could, we could spend the time finding or looking for or helping them create that would, that would, um, be advantageous to them and seeing what their needs were. They're, the one that they said was that, you know, you work, they work with, like you work with what you have and those who are volunteering, those who are willing to be on staff. And one of the biggest challenges they had was having a lot on staff who weren't um, necessarily um, trained in, in therapy or a, like a therapeutic role, but needed to function as in that role. And one of the biggest challenges is one, you know, cross-cultural training has it presents its own set of challenges um but outside of that was um the time so they have limited staff the staff works as much as they possibly can and even getting the time like you said just take time away I think that's not a reality for at least a lot of the partnerships that I see is they don't really have the chance to get away because they're they're someone need, is needing to be there with the girls the work continues mm-hmm. And they have a hard time even finding a good way to train every like the staff um, because of the amount of time that they have to take away t- in this end. Um, but the, yeah, the, so the, it's it's only a challenge of like of learning that. But I think that that's a really valuable thing. That's really necessary. I think that's a good point. But one of the things that we see working with Tamar some of the years is is if you don't take some time and figure out how to build that into your system, your, yeah. your ministry will not be sustainable. It mm-hmm. won't be. It will not. And then you won't be long-term. You'll be, you'll actually be, and that's when you see get some jaded, organizations you know, get like down. really, and, and they've started to address that a lot more in recent years, which is, which has been awesome. Um, but yeah, I think they started to address it because there was a large amount of burnout Agreed. and, um, like what you're talking about, like, uh, it, 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 the trauma of, experience seeing like exploitation on that level is obviously you know hard to speak like it, it's incredibly important to understand like trauma and how it affects the brain and, and absolutely everything. but then also like what you're talking about like secondary trauma is a real thing and like it's an oxygen mask principle type of thing where if we want um if you want to serve the best that you can you do have to be in healthy place like work um, actively work on being a, a, in a healthy place yourself. And, and yeah. a lot of times that what that, I think the big differential there is, is support. Absolutely. Like it takes support to be able to do those things. And, and, and that's, um, I and would that's say, what I see a lot of groups. Well, wanting. and that's our, th- that's where I feel like our primary role is at community faith. Right. Like it, pastoral care. They've asked like, me to be a pastor to them. So right. when we land there, you know, we awesome. may have a team with us to go be a part of the experience, getting to know our churches, being doing some activities with them. We might be doing some painting, working in areas, building houses, do, do whatever we do. But then Beth and I, a lot of times we'll go in a week ahead of time and stay a week later. And that week ahead of time, we may be having, we may be taking all the pastors out for dinner three nights in a row. And we may just be having, we, we, we sometimes just do a children's fun day with their kids. We'll take them to the water park, take all their kids, all the workers' kids to the water park, you know? So we've done that and people go, well, you're going on a mission trip and you're going to, you're taking the kids to the water park kind of mission trip is that i said no no we're going there and coming back they've been there all along they don't get out of that zone these kids never go to the water park it's right, right there in their town the nicest water park and they can't afford it they can't go do it they, they don't have, have time. the time they for it away. and and the one thing good about us is we come they can go hey pastor troy and the, the team are paying for this we got to go do this and so you know how you do when uncle earl comes and aunt, aunt jenny comes you kind of clean the house up and get ready so it makes them take a break and then we take daniel and steffi out and we have found the most valuable thing maybe we can do that maybe we're short term while we're there but for the long-term relationship is invest in them yeah as invest people, in, the, yeah, in, in, in their care in and their, relationship, it gets them ready important. it gets yeah. them ready for the next round in their in the story let me ask another question here uh follow up to that uh, what needs to be happened ruth from your perspective uh 
to to get our churches in the U.S. Since you're focusing on U.S. churches and people, a good kick in the rear. We, <laughs> we, what, what would it take to what, what do you see? Be be prophet Ruth for a minute. That's not that's a biblical <laughs> name. Be a prophet Ruth for a minute, and, and and how could you give people a good kick in the seat to get more to get out of uh, just their lethargy and, and and maybe get in there and let's get out there and battle for the lives of our brothers and sisters that are caught in this trafficking world. How could we make a difference even from this side of the planet to that side of the planet? Yeah. And I, I think beyond just the issue of human trafficking in American churches and in churches all around the world, like this is not a problem exclusive to the U S there's just so much inward Mm -hmm. vision, so much focus on, you know, our church needs this, our church needs that, our local, you know, our local, sometimes not even a a focus on local needs. But I think there's just like a lack of awareness about what's happening elsewhere in the world and Mm -hmm. how we have maybe contributed to that, helped cause it, helped perpetuate it, so on and so forth. Um, There's, there can be a mindset of, oh, you know, it's not our problem. It's so far away. It's not meaningful to us. And I think educating yourself and your church about, it, do, it doesn't have to be human trafficking. There are about a million other things going absolutely, on in the world that, you, that your church can choose to focus There's on. There's all kinds of poverty and justice issues that you engage yeah, in. Yeah, and, and I think something that the other church that I've worked with has told me that's really spoken to me is that a lot of the reason why they choose to pursue these partnerships is because they have so much to learn from organizations overseas about mm-hmm. how to combat issues in yeah. their in their you know local space. And so right. I think it's not just about what can we give you know, what can we do for these poor people overseas? You know, like that's so the wrong attitude. It's what is needed here and who can we partner with and learn from so that we can do that better here. Right. And I think us going over there has made us more aware. Yeah, for sure. You know, I don't think I would have noticed that we have a major sex trafficking issue here. Had I not gone over and served there, it's opened my eyes to not just what I saw there, but then when you come back here, you go, Oh, We've got, this is happening here. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not just after my long 12 hour flight, you know, and and being on a plane forever. I I can drive out to the local truck stop and go, oh my. Or I can drive down the street and see this massage parlor and go, this isn't what we would call therapeutic massage. This looks a little different. We've got places like that popping up all over our area. And it's just a real issue. So let me follow that question on that nature. Setting aside the Thailand, your Thailand side for a second and uh, comparing uh, it to human trafficking and sex trafficking, do you find that the US, are we, are we, are we, um, are we saints? Are we above it all? Are we free from such horrific evil uh, of our own of human trafficking? Or maybe, or maybe as we talk about our brothers and sisters across the planet that uh, we're talking about the speck in their eye, maybe we have a plank hanging out our own eye here. And, and there, and there might be things we can learn from, maybe we can learn from Tamar Center things that we could actually apply here. Maybe there's organizations over there that could help us learn from them that we could actually come back here and change our own people around us. I mean, another leading question, but I'm happy to answer I know. I'm just throwing it out. I'm just throwing it out. Yeah, I mean, the U.S. is like the worst of all. That's the lawyer. That's the future lawyer in her coming out. (laughs) It's the worst of all because not only do these issues exist, people pretend that they don't think they're better than everybody else, go and try to fix other people instead of looking at what's happened here, cause issues everywhere else, have caused wars. Like, you know, it's it's the worst of all, I would say. We project it on other people and then deny that it's even in our own boundaries. Yeah, you say these people are so backwards. Oh. Oh, primitive. primitive. The the bathroom. Look at us. Look at them. We have you know and, this and this and this. When and our you know. and our snow out here is perfectly driven and it's clean and over there. Look at what they have to do. And what we don't realize is our yellow snow is all around us. We are in the midst and we're of causing some. Like I think, uh, like oh, it was important. We're victimizing people around the planet and we're destroying yeah. our own space right we here. We are locally. actively a part of the global issue and And many many churches are really focused on hey we need a new gutter we need a new keyboard we need to do this thing for our church family we got to put a new parking lot in and i'm not not we need those things to be right so churches can be whole but their main focus is us for inside these walls and no more and really if you look around things are not good right now but Uh, and i think i think even more than than that is that some of the other countries have bought into that. Like they believe that things are better here. here. And so they, they, they drink, because a lot of the, 
the girls that get caught in trafficking in Thailand, they want to marry some foreigner who's going to be rich and whisk them away. Well, and, and it's not what they think it is when they find out. It's it's a facade. Well, I mean, wealth is like disproportionately concentrated in the West. So in, oh, in that sense, yeah. things right. are like much better. Access to resources, certain yes. resources right. and wealth. Yes. And if you're yes. white, you know, heterosexual, cisgendered, upper middle class, like it is better. It's so much better. Yeah. Um, most of the time. Mm. And so it's like, it's, it's difficult to, you know, hold those two things together. Like, yeah, there are a lot of things here that don't exist elsewhere in the world. And, you know, we can Oppor be very, there's definitely more opportunity here. Yeah, We more, can be yeah, very absolutely. grateful for that. And if you're in a position of right. privilege, recognizing that and then going, okay, so what am I going to do? And you that? can, and you right. can't control where yeah. you're born. You can't control the color of your skin. You can't control the gender you're born in. But what you can do is recognize the opportunity you've given. And as, especially as Christians, we should realize that we have been given, whether it's one talent or two or three, you are held responsible for how you use that to benefit uh, and bless other people right. and don't reflect lord the Lord it over people. Yeah. Don't mm -hmm. say, oh, I'm better than you are because yeah. I have, but see it as an opportunity. How can I, how can I help? Mm -hmm. It's I not think, a social status, I, but yeah. it's an what opportunity. It's, it's a greater opportunity. It may be, uh, it may be you have an opportunity to serve in a better way. And rather than seeing it as a treasure, you need to lay it down as a gift. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think, and I think people mistake like wealth and like the opportunity and those things that we have, you know, that we, do have like, the access to these things that is more like disproportionately like greater in in the Western civilization as um as like knowledge and wisdom and intelligence and all these things and it gives them a superiority complex when when they don't equate you know like um there is so much like you said like there is so much to learn from these other organizations who are in fact doing things much better than we are here and so i do think that sometimes we like americans can fall into this trap of thinking because we have more wealth and more like more access to wealth and resources we must know more which is not the case and i at least from my experience very much not the case in this particular field where we um other places have been paving the way for a lot longer than we have. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really important when you're wanting to get involved in this issue. Like you mentioned, like one of my questions is actually, you've mentioned it a couple of times of um, the importance of education and educating yourself before you're getting involved in, um, as you're <laughs> starting to try and create relationships with people um, and, and, and trying to create that um, mentality of learning from others. Um, where 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 do people where do you suggest people start with that mm -hmm. i mean that's a good question i think depends on exactly what you're interested in but there's so many organizations that are so transparent about what they do and i think that's an excellent thing like if you go to the international justice mission website you can read about their entire theory of change, all the work they're doing. They have extensive reports, studies that they've done in-house on tra what trafficking looks like. You can read, there's that thick 300 plus page. 623 page. 623 <laughs> page huge. human trafficking yeah. report. Like that is available on the internet. Absolutely, you know? download so it, yeah. If it, you it, want it, email us at info at on the doc.org. I'll send you the link. Yeah, yeah. you. I'll send you even more than that if you'd like. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me layer on a question here real quick. What makes... What, 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 in your opinion, as you look at this and you, you, you have Thai heritage, you, you, you come from the, the Asian side of the world and, but yet you've been a part of the, the American culture for a long time. You speak English as well as anybody at this table. You're, you, you're here in this country. What, what do you think from your, your time, what makes the U S church partnership? What, what do you see? What are, what's something that you think would make it successful? And what is the thing that you think could damage it, make it unsuccessful? Could you give us a couple, maybe either way, just to kind of get us on, help people listening here, get on the right track. We want to get them all started good. And then also tell us what are those first pitfalls that we don't want to do? That's the most damaging. Yeah. Well, I think what makes us churches such, uh, like have such potential to do good is that there are so many resources. Like I think there's a, a culture of giving, here, um, you know, people are very accustomed to, to donating and to, you know, being generous with what they have. And I think those are resources that people elsewhere do not always have access to. Um, and so I think that's a huge asset. That's good. I appreciate um, that. That's good. Yeah. Sure. And I think, um, 
I mean, there's also a lot of great examples of work that's being done here. Like there's a lot of great NGOs that operate in the U.S. that, you know, you can take examples of just like executive function. You know, this is how we run like a successful organization. This is how we recruit people. This is how like we figure out, um, you know, taxes and how we account for our donations and all that. I think there's a lot of knowledge. You can see through the organizations. You can see they're doing right things. They've got good. Yeah, out. there's there's a lot of transparency. Uh, there's accountability measures here that you know money's or, being spent appropriately. Right, that right. may or may not exist the, elsewhere. Their nine nineties are filed. You can see all that stuff. Like yeah, ours are. so I think there's there's knowledge there that can really easily be shared as well. well. What's 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 the pitfall now? What would you what would you make sure that you don't want to make those first? Pa- yeah, if you th- I think if you make those good things, you're transparent, like you're saying. You're really you're, all the things you're saying. But what is that step you don't want to take that gets you? in the bad side of this and really put you on the, on the wrong side of doing good. I think not listening to the organizations you're partnering with right. going in thinking, we know everything. This is, we need you to do this and driving this. your agenda down. Somebody you're trying to help's throat. Yes. Okay. Yes. And just <laughs> basically making yourself a burden saying like, we will be helping you. We're not going to listen to what you actually want us this to do. This money comes with these strings. Yes. And, and mm-hmm. thinking you're, you're so great for doing it, you know, being thinking you're such a savior that these, poor people like you know are never going to make it without your help yeah. like that's that's completely and, the wrong and, 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 and right. the language there that we used in one of the episodes you mentioned it, there you can if you want to take the white savior complex or if you mm-hmm. are, are you it didn't have to be white or white or in color you can just say my American. church my <laughs> church is superior complex yeah. and it can be a church it's like our church that's knows right. the right way we you know so you, you the biggest thing you're saying is don't start down that pathway Absolutely not. I think that's great. And, and the what, best way to do it is to really vet the organization, get to know who you're working with, spend that time. So it's really almost two sides of the same coin. If you spent the time over here, then you probably won't fall in this pitfall. Yeah. And so make sure you're not just jumping. I mean, the, we want the Lord, the we want the Lord to speak to people. The, we course. want the Lord to give people visions and dreams of the kingdom, but make sure that you take the time to vet that out. When Joseph got the vision of where, where God would do with him down the road, it was 20 years down the road and a lot of hard hoeing before he found out how God would use him. I think a lot of Christians here get a call. Aunt Beth gets a, Aunt Beth gets a big thing on her burden and she happens to have some money and she says, let's do this over here. It'll help these people versus spending the time to really say, now, God, I've got this. How do I spend this best? And maybe in conversation with somebody that knows what's really needed most. You've got to listen to the experts. You can't just go in and, and just jump and act just like you're the expert. And yeah. you're not going to establish a missionary overseas that's got any sustainability overnight with no research and no cultural connection and, and, and oh, working in digital. People want to start people. their own organization so that their name can be on it so that they have complete control. Right. And it's yeah, control right. is always, that's yeah. the wrong start right off the Completely. bat. Well, and I think sometimes God makes us, you know, wait to fulfill those visions. He yeah. Gives us so you might partly need to spend so he can time. humble us. You know, besides yeah. learning, he's also trying to humble our spirits, you know, yeah. so that we yeah. can also. So so go serve. The first thing you would right. say maybe so is find serve. a good organization exactly. and just go yeah. serve. You don't have to take your whole church. And for us, for Beth here and I, when we got involved in Thailand, we didn't go as a church. I went as a pastor to one person to go observe I wasn't there to do their wedding. They were getting married in Thai. I was going to do the wedding on this side. And I just wanted to go experience their side so I could relate to the bride on our side. I didn't want to ask her to come here and do this and this and not know what her side of the culture was. So I went on a, we went on a long trip and spent a, you know, a lot of resources to go there. And it was invaluable to me to learn Mm -hmm. that. And it's, it's helped my relationship. And in that it opened a world of, I went to learn and in learning, uh, God was able to really show me where I could be used. Right, and we didn't even go there for that purpose. Never that, planned. That was right. never... And, and often that can lead to something really in, incredible later on. So Celeste from right. Don Nam, which we've talked about in a couple other episodes, she's the only person right now basically who's doing ministry and, and providing care to like exclusively lady boys who are coming out of the sex trafficking industry. And, and, and it, as far as you can tell, anywhere I mean, doing this kind of work. It's really a a big thing in Thailand, like this, that that kind of problem doesn't exist to the same degree anywhere else in the world. But so for all intents and purposes, yes. Very niche group, but but a very serious issue that yes. needs, needs and, very special. And she didn't start off going to Thailand and thinking, this is what I want. She started, you know, working, I believe, as a counselor for another organization and spent several years with them and was realizing there's this population that we're seeing that's not being served. And right. she really felt a calling to do that herself. But it, it was with complete humility, not I'm going to go in and I'm going to yeah. do this myself and I'm going to be so great, but 
God just like put that on her heart and, mm-hmm. and that's where she ended up. And she's such a, a pioneer in, in that area of service. And that's how, how God does things. If you go yeah. and just sit and wait and listen, uh, I think the Lord will show you if you're willing to learn. We use an acronym here when we t- train our leaders and pastors uh, called Fat Sheep. God loves Fat Sheep, faithful, available, and teachable. <laughs> faithful being willing to go and take your faith and open up your life and go walk. Available meaning you're not there to do somebody else's agenda. You're there to be available to God to do right. God's agenda. Yeah. And if you'll be patient, God will show you where he needs you and yeah. he'll show you the people that, that that need you. And maybe you do have a gift. Maybe you really have a gift that would benefit that organization and you could be God's gift there, but you won't be God's gift if you go with your own agenda. Right. You right. gotta be there for God's agenda and finally teach you've got to learn in the process. You've got to listen and you've got to have grace and you've mm-hmm. got to wait and see this. And Joseph waited 20 years and all of a sudden, boom, God put him right where he needed to, but it mm-hmm. took a lot of time and a lot of patience. I've got one more big question. We, we were at, at, at the 45 minute mark. And if we can deal with this question, I think we can get out of this series. And, and this is my question as a, as a, as a, as a pastor that has a heart for evangelism, and I mean evangelism in a good sense, and not in a good sense that in a good sense that we share the good news. First uh, Peter three fifteen, hands of hope. My foundation is mission statement is uh, uh, is basically be prepared to give an answer for the hope that's within you, but do this with gentleness and meekness. We want to go and be the, the light of Christ and let people see that, and then make their decision on their experience. We want to we want to lift up the tide everywhere in a, in a positive way. How do we? How do we, the U.S. church, and, and let's just say the, the, the church globally, how do we do the Great Commission and be authentically the church of Jesus Christ, doing the right thing for God, the godly thing, not the good thing, the right thing? We're called to do the Great Commission. I mean, that's not an option for us. That That's the commission. It's been done so wrong so many times in so many ways, but I'm not willing to throw that responsibility out. But what I do understand is that we have to do it the right way. And that takes time and process. So how do we do the Great Commission right uh, and be the church, uh, whether it's in Thailand or other places? What, what would be your first steps to helping the U.S. church make those steps out? Mm. Well, <laughs> my personal, again, I, I can't speak no. from much expertise here, but I think from what I've seen and, and what I feel, I think the most important thing is to like, you have to let go of yourself and any agenda that you may have. People really like to hear themselves talk. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you have to let go of all of that and remember that you are never who you are doing this for. And I think you have to let God show you authentically what is actually needed there. Because I think very rarely what's needed is for people to come in and shove the gospel down people's throats yeah. and you know force them saying, this is gonna help you when you're not really showing right. them how it's gonna help them at all. Right. There are so many different needs. And sometimes, you know, what they need might be just like a, a place for community, a place for right. people to learn about God. But oftentimes that that love is going to be shown through something else. And you have to really pay attention to what are the needs and what gifts do I personally have? You know, you also don't want to go in and say, um, like, I think I can help with this when you have no skills. You don't have the right. It, it's not your gifting. Um, you could potentially do more harm than good there. So think where, where what has God given me? what needs exist there Mm -hmm. and from there you just have to go and start doing good work we talked about excellence Excellence from christian organizations you can't go in and do a terrible job thinking oh it's okay because i'm spreading the gospel it's absolutely not you have to first of all just i think do a good job put in the work do the research you're not going to get results right away you're not going to see fruit in the first six months you're there you have to go and really immerse yourself Learn from people who know what's really going on. Don't do it by yourself. Partner with people who've lived there their whole lives, who right. are from there. Um, and then you just show them what it means to be a Christian. You show them God's love through your actions. And then when they come to you and they're ready and they ask, why are you doing this? You know, what what is giving you the hope or the, the strength to keep going? What is what is making you want to provide all that you are? Then you tell them, mm-hmm. you know. You just described yeah. the first Peter 315 moment, and that happens after, I, I've been writing your list down here, that's number seven. You yeah. know, so it's not number one. A lot of people will go in and go, Here, here's number one. We yeah. want you all to get saved. But what you said was, you got to let go of yourself. You got to understand it's not about you. You got to do good work while you're doing it. You, Listen you've got, to God. You got to, you got to, don't do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. you know, and listen to God, you're going to work along other people. And then, then somebody might ask you, why are you doing this? Yeah. 
you know, and yeah. then that there's your opportunity to be authentic because your, your work has preceded you. Your faith is out there. And now people are asking you, their free will is asking you why. Yeah. I want to close with one story here. Um, uh, it's it, it's it's totally unrelated, but it, and it's it'll be vanity on my part. But it was it was something that was powerful. Our church here, uh, Hands Hope Foundation, has been doing surgical medical missions uh, to to Liberia for years, and the school teacher at our school in Liberia, at Wayla School, is Islamic. He's he's a Muslim. And I knew that I knew when they hired him, he was, and, and you know what? He was the best person to teach computers and no problem with me. It's a Christian school. He was who was available. They hired him. We went in and out of there two or three years, two or three years. And he would stand on the porch and he would watch all that we do, the surgical missions. We do surgeries and all this. Stuff. He, on, on the, on the third mission trip, he came up to me and he said, pastor Troy, I've got questions. I've been watching you people come and go for three years now. I've been watching Dr. Omana come in, Dr. Parks come in the 30, 60 nurses. You do all these people's cases. I just want to tell you, what are you getting from this? How much are you making for this? You people got to be making a lot of money to come here. I said, Muhammad, it's, it's not what you think. I said, I'm not a paid staff member. I'm here as a volunteer. I'm like Haley. I'm low paid staff of an executive director of foundation. <laughs> Zero. I'm, I'm Actually, not currently paid yeah. at all. I said, not really? only did I pay, I also paid for, I paid for my airline ticket. I, I've taken out time from work. And by the way, doctor, doctor, the doctor that's walking past there, he didn't just pay for his own way, which was $3,000. He also paid for two nurses to come. He left his practice for two weeks. I want you to know he's a world renowned eye surgeon and he will not be able to bill those charges for the next two weeks in the amount of X. And he says, you're kidding. I said, he said, so you, it costs you money to come here? I said, there's not a person here that didn't cost a lot to come. And you've been coming here for three years. I've been watching you. Why do you people do this? I said, because God called us to, to go. And we came here because we love the Liberian people and we want to be a part of this. That night I was doing one of our, our open gospel presentations. We were out in the village and, and we showed the Jesus film. I don't know if you've ever seen the Jesus film, but it's just presentational life of Christ. And we were showing the film and always at the end of the Jesus film, we just tell people, if you've seen this, if you've, you've enjoyed what we've been doing and you want to talk more about Christ, we're here to talk with you about Christ. Come on up. We'd love to talk to you, pray with you in any way possible. And, and at, when I gave that invitation for people to come speak to us, Muhammad was front of the line. I didn't know he was even there. He got to the front. We, they always make a line. Come past this line, and then the, the librarians will begin to talk to you. He came to the line and stepped over the line. I said, if you want to come talk to us, come step over. He got to the line. I thought, oh, no, Muhammad, stop. I went down to Muhammad. I, I gave the mic to the other the local pastor, and I said, Muhammad, you can't come across this line. You're, you're, you're Muslim, number one. And if you don't know this, Muslims in Liberia, if they convert to Christianity, their own families will kill them. You, know, you understand that? It's, it's a death sentence for him. And so I go down to his top. I said, he said, he says, I decided I want to follow your Christ. I said, yeah, I, I don't want you to do that right now. I, I know we talked today on the porch and I, I, look, I want you to really think about this big decision. I want you to go on back and we'll talk later. So, so we got back up there. The pastor gave another invitation. He said, you know, if you'd like to be prayed for, uh, come up, the, the team would pray for you. I looked down and Muhammad's back across the line again. And he said, and he I said, Muhammad, I, I told you, let's talk about this later. I want you to really weigh out this decision to be a follower of Christ. And he said, I've been weighing this decision out for three to four years while I've watched you guys come and go. And I always thought you guys were being paid to do this. I had no idea you came just because you loved us. And he says, I'm willing to die for this. I want to be a Christian. And I prayed for him that night. And it, you know, and you know, he was ostracized by his family. He wasn't killed, but, but he did, he did have to separate. And I think what you're saying, number seven takes time. Somebody really realizing you're real and you don't have some ulterior motive. If you do that, yeah. Muhammad is a strong believer today and he's changing lots of people's lives and nobody coerced him or tricked him or forced him. It just took time for him yeah. to really see the light of Christ. And I think like being transparent, like being transparent and authentically yourself and like it's not something that you're like trying to keep a secret of like, oh yes, I want to share the love of Jesus with someone. But there's a difference between being transparent and being like and and saying, you know, like this is the reason that that we do this and creating this uh, feeling of like obligation for someone of like there's an exchange of like services. Like, yeah. We're doing this so that you do this. He's the first guy I've ever and tried I think to that's talk a big out difference. of it. But also like I think like I mean, your whole paper, you know, is exploring the relationship between these right. things. And I think that relation like. For me, it always keeps coming back, even like when you're sharing Jesus here with friends and family and things like that. There's a relationship that's built when you want to share those things and express those things authentically and, and share the hope and love. And 
And I think that's like one of the most important aspects, at least from what I've seen is, um, in the great commission is that relationship. And in that relationship, you, you want, when you have a relationship with someone in there, they have these specific needs. If you have the ability or could, um, help with those certain things or partner with them or encourage them or support them. That's like a natural outflow of healthy relationship. And so I think when you're doing it through that versus, um, kind of like, I think it's a less, less agenda driven, if that makes sense. Like it's just to, to love others. Well, well, Ruth, one of the things I want to say to you is as we wrap up is as you write this, this list that you've given at the end, I'm going to be selfish right now as a pastor and the U.S. church. I think as you refine that and work on that, it's a solid, solid list. And I will look forward as you process and you, you dialogue and you look at this. I, I would love to see an appendix or, 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 or a, a, a page somewhere in your work that speaks to the churches and saying, here's how you could do the Great Commission right. And, and here are some steps because I like the fact that you end up with 1 Peter 3.15 at the very end, but you give a good process that, that's, that, that I think is what the Lord really wants and that could, could cause everybody to be blessed. And I think one of the things you could do is be a good, when you're done with this, you might offer some good coaching tips <laughs> uh, and make sure that we do it a little bit better as we go forward. It's been incredible. So when you think about that, I, I think yeah. you, I think you need to have a, something like this in, at, at that and, and continue to flush that out. Cause I, I want, I want to buy the book. <laughs> I do. I'm excited. I'm excited about what you're doing. Thank I you. think, I think not only can you're learning, but I think you could turn around and, and, and help churches become more successful and not fall in those pitfalls. Yeah. And I think you're learning things that are, other people won't learn. I know you're just doing your, 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 your bachelor's level stuff, but I, there's not a lot of people writing from this perspective and mm-hmm. you're doing the hard work. So I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you so much for being here, Ruth. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, we, we're looking for forward to, I, I can't wait to read your stuff. And, and, and someday I want to be on your famous show when you're, when you're, <laughs> when you're real famous and you're a lawyer. We may call you someday when you have a problem, but uh, thank you, Haley, so much yeah. for bringing your, your perspective in here. Mother Beth, anybody got anything else before we wrap up? That was the big question. I, I love, again, that list, and I'm going to work on that with you and um, develop that. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an incredible episode. Uh, go back and listen to them all. And make sure you go back and, and find, uh, it may not have been out yet, but watch for our Mosaic uh, uh, Initiative uh, podcast series. Also, make sure you go check out the Tamar Center series as well. They're all kind of connected and interwoven. There's a lot of good material there. And you can find out more at onthedoc.org, and you can email us at info at onthedoc.org and get more information about these things. If you heard something in here, reference to an organization or ministry, reach out to us. We'll get that information to you, and we can also get uh, get with Ruth and get information to pass on to you as well. And, and we'd love to have you join us. Make sure you find us on all of our platforms, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Facebook, Roku, uh, Rumble, and SermonNet. Love to hear your feedback on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Telegram. And always, if you find us, please subscribe, hit like, notify, and tell others. Share it. Give your comments. We'd love to have you there and let other people be a part of this community here, uh, the On The Dock community. And we always would love to have you as our sponsor or our partner. So check that out at Patreon. Go to the Patreon site and look for those opportunities to be a partner with us. And you can get all that through the on the doc.org website link as well. And as always, if you are in the community faith uh, region of Marion, Illinois, we'd love to have you be a part of this community faith. Come check us out 10 o'clock on Sundays, Wednesdays at 630. You can uh, come join us and see us. If you can't get here, you're too far away. You're in Singapore, you know, and and it's monsoon season there, typhoon season. You can find us at coftv.com. Although your time would be upside down. You have to watch this night at coftv.com. We have embedded player. We'd love to have you join us online at either our Facebook or YouTube channels under community faith church. So it's been such a pleasure to be talking with you in this series. Uh, please check it all out. We look forward to seeing more of you on the dock again, Ruth. Thank you. Haley, Beth, thank you. And Colt special. Thank you for you sitting in and running everything over there. You've done a great job. God bless you, brother. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you soon we'll be back with many more series check us out tuesdays and thursdays tuesday and thursdays for our podcast and you're on the dock with pastor troy See you soon.